What is up and welcome back to How to Invest in Commercial Real Estate. What's up, guys? We are excited to be here. We have a pretty cool show. It may be a little short and sweet, but it's 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 worth knowing, that is for sure. But before we get to that, we want to talk about what is going on in our, our world right now, obviously. And um, we have a new deal. We have a new deal that we're sweet. launching out. I think it it's probably already launched by the time this is aired. What is the name of it? It is a build to suit. So we're building a building for Nucky's Hoagies. Nucky's Hoagies. Nucky's it's, Hoagies. A, it's a sandwich get, shop. Get you some Nuckies. Yep. So this is a super familiar location for us because if you remember when we launched the six pad sites in Princeton and we're going to put up the site plan now that I swear. Put the site plan up. Yeah, put Banner. the site plan up. And... Um, we bought all of the land around this brand new Market Street grocery store that's being built right now, and we developed six pad sites. And this this parcel was just kind of a holdout landowner. We finally acquired the parcel. We put it up for lease, and it went like that. And now we have a lease with Nucky's Hoagies. We're going to build them a building. It should be super fast construction timeline, fairly fast exit timeline. So we modeled it up for 18 months, but realistically, it'll probably exit before that. And how big is the equity raise and what's the IRR projected? Yep, the equity raise is 560000 and we're projecting a 27.83 IRR or a 1.36 equity multiple. So pretty nice. good. That's yeah. assuming. So we'll hold it for typical 18 months or so, 18 months or less probably. 18 months, which leaves a lot of room for error in permitting, mobilization, construction, or the exit. We have almost you know nine months to a year buffered in of just... Anyway, so really exciting deal. It's on the website. Go check it out. If you're not a member of the investor list, I don't know what else to say at this point other than shame on you. You should yeah, be on right. it. Should Go to the website. Um, anyway, so now we're going to get into the, the, the episode here, and it starts with how to make a competitive offer, right? When you buy a, a property, when you're getting this deal, whether you're doing a joint venture with somebody else, whether you're buying an apartment complex or an industrial building or a piece of land, You've got to make a competitive offer. Yeah, you found a deal that you really like. You think that the returns are good, but a lot of times good deals have competition. And so today we just thought we'd go over a few keys to help your offer stand out in the event you have a deal you want to buy, but there's a bunch of different bidders trying to get that deal from you. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of like going out to dinner with your wife. You're never going to pick the perfect restaurant. So you just ask your wife, where do you want to go? You're never going to write the perfect offer. Unless you ask the seller or the seller's broker, most likely, hey, how can I make my offer stand out? How can I make it more competitive? What does the seller want to see on this offer that would bring me to the top of the pile? Yeah, top of the pile. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the key here, guys, is that you want, you're digging for information and you're going to do it in the most subtle way possible, but you want that broker to give you as much information about that deal, about the competitors, about what the seller wants as possible. So, you know, it may it may start out as, hey, how long does the seller own this? What's the seller's objectives in selling? Why are they selling? You know, try to understand the seller's motivation. And then once you have that, okay, a broker, how many people do you expect to bid on this? What kind of people are bidding on this? Are they big institutional buyers? Are they individual buyers? Trying to, you know, judge what their offer is going to look like. And so the first thing, like you say, is to Talk to the broker and ask the broker these types of questions. But the main one, as Braden said, is, hey, what, where does this offer need to be? What, what, where does this likely trade? That's a question we ask a lot. And the broker tends to tell you, hey, I think this is going to trade at this number. Yeah. Uh, and that may not, but every little piece of information you can get out of that broker, is, it will help you in crafting the offer that will help make you as competitive as possible. Yeah, because we had some deals where sometimes it's it's just price, right? But other times the uh, owner wants a, a quick deal, right? He wants to close really quick. And so um, it's not always about price. So like Joel said, the more information you can find out, the better and more attractive your offer can be. Yeah, at the end of the day, you know, we, we bought hundreds of millions of dollars of commercial real estate at this point. And every single deal, something is, is their Im importance to something is different, right? Like they may let you have the longest due diligence time ever because you're paying so much more than anybody else. They may uh, allow you all of this wiggle room. Whereas um, on the contrary, you know, somebody may, may be willing to take a million or half a million dollars less because this person is offering a cash closing in 30 days. Mm -hmm. So you have all of these different uh, 
variables and you need these data points uh, before you can go in and start to craft your offer. And then, you know, I think now we're just going to get into what we think makes us competitive buyers, I feel like, because at this point, we ask that a lot. Hey, how can how can I place a competitive offer? When it's something you really want to buy, you have to ask that question. Every now and then you're going to lose a deal, but it, we don't want it to be because we wrote a crappy offer, you know? So like, what is what is the deal? Typically, they give you pricing guidance or uh, cap rate guidance on in-place income or whatever it is. Yeah, you know, we're looking at around this number, you know, that every broker is going to do that unless it's Every now and then you'll run into like a real stickler about it. And then you're running into due diligence. What's the typical DD period? You know, what do we want to see here? They may say something crazy like two weeks or we're expecting non-refundable earnest money day one because we've got 20 offers coming in. You may just walk away right there. It's like, oh, I was trying to get a deal on this property. Non-refundable earnest money, I'm out. Like there's so many variables. So uh, speaking about earnest money, uh, can that make your offer more attractive? Some um, non-refundable from... Day one or a weekend yeah, or percent, like that. 100% non-refundable earnest money is attractive to a seller because it drastically increases the likelihood that you're going to perform, that you're going to close. It gives them confidence. that you're Right. And, you know, this has happened to me where we've, we've gotten something under contract to sell as a seller and the buyer does the due diligence and tours our properties. I have to let the staff know that we're potentially selling and then they don't they don't close and mm -hmm. it disrupts the staff and they're they're in limbo thinking we were going to have a job now we're not going to have a job now we are still going to have our job and so as a seller i want to know that the buyer is just going to do what they say they're going to do and they're going to buy that property and as long as they have refundable earnest money and a period of time where they can just kick the tires around mm -hmm. you don't know if you have a sale and so the number one way to and let me preface this if you're wanting to get a deal then you need to steer away from what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, you know, if there's competition and you're trying to make your offer more attractive, well, then that, that is going to limit your ability to get a really good deal. But if you find a property that you already think is a good deal, okay, at the price that they're asking, well, now we've got to figure out how to make, make that deal happen. Yeah. Uh, so we're not trying to get, it already is a good deal. We're not trying to get it a really good deal. We're trying to buy the asset. And the number one way to do that is to offer non-refundable earnest money day one. And uh, for all the, the newer investors, this is a risky strategy. Mm -hmm. So this is not for everybody to consider. You're not getting that money back. You, you know, speaking from someone that has lost uh, a quarter million dollars in earnest money on a deal by not closing, this is risky. So there are certain deals that you don't want to employ this strategy on. Uh, and if you're not confident in the seller being honest, then uh, you shouldn't do this. We should also hedge that you should only do this if you have a great real estate contract, a great real estate attorney, and you're comfortable you know, with what it, what it says, what your outs are. Because once you offer that non-refundable earnest money, you wire it to the title company, the probability of you getting it back is next to nothing. Yeah, it's pretty low. And, and this non-refundable earnest money is usually tied to what? A closing date or a period of time? After? Performance on what you guys agreed upon or what yeah. you said you were going to do. Yeah. So you'll sign the PSA and a standard is a 30-day due diligence period, a 30-day closing period, and 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 then you close you know you may have a couple built-in extensions or something but after that there may be a remedy or two the seller can pretty much have the right to go after the earnest money and yeah so let me give an example uh we're bidding on some multifamily units and we think it's a really good deal and so one of our strategies to set us apart is we're offering non-refundable earnest money in the in the amount of maybe a hundred thousand dollars now, uh, why am I doing that? A couple reasons. First is it's an institutional seller. So the institutional seller is most likely not going to be able to mislead you in the condition of the property. They have too much to lose. They're, they're professionals. Uh, they want to be by the book and they don't want to get sued. And, and so they're just going to be honest with the condition of the property. They're going to be honest with the income and it, whatever it is, it is. Now, if you're buying from a, a mom and pop that is not an institution that, that, you know, doesn't have any reputation to uphold, you may not want to take that risk because you don't know what they may or may not be telling you. And you may not find any negative uh, aspects of the property until it's too late. But on this case, we toured the properties and uh, they're really clean. And, and so there's, there's nothing I could tell 
uh, from, from walking the units where anything that I have to be afraid of, obviously we've owned a bunch of multifamily. So non in front of earnest money is an uh, attempt for us to put our offer ahead saying, Hey, push comes to shove. We're not going to get it under contract and wait for 30 days and then say, Oh no, we were just kidding about offering that price. We're going to lower our number. Yeah. No, they know that, that if I go under contract that they have a hundred thousand dollars of my money. So if I try to back out or retrade them on price, yeah. They're going to say no. They're going to take my hundred thousand, and they're going to go to seller number two, yeah. or, or sorry, buyer number two, and they're going to try to get them to close. Uh, so it's a really powerful tool if you find a deal you want to offer that non-refundable earnest money. Okay, and and Braden, you mentioned due diligence. I assume you said typical good catch. You said typical period of time might be thirty days. I assume the seller wants as short a period of time as possible, right? Because that of course. he just gets his money quicker. Yeah. So for reference, um, the in a standard transaction, you put up refundable earnest money that goes non-refundable after your inspection period. So that inspection period allows you to inspect the roof, inspect environmental, inspect all of these things and, and pull out kind of cost free. You get your earnest money back. Um, I mean, you paid for your own inspection. So it's, it's a normal, cheap way of doing business. Now, I will say to, to Joel's point, even when we offer non-refundable earnest money, we put in that they have to deliver clean title. We put in material adverse change clauses. We put in that they have to deliver a clear environmental study because these are things out of our control, right? So the seller may not know that they have a bad environmental study. We get a bad phase one, our lender pulls out, and then we don't have that in there. Seller keeps our hundred grand. We don't have anything. That's a shitty day for everyone, you know, mm -hmm. except the seller, actually. Yeah. So those are great points. So let's talk about those three things. First was the, the environmental. Is we get it out for environmental because... If there is environmental issues, they can be very expensive and very tedious to clean up. And you, like Braden said, you, if your lender finds out about them, and typically they do require a clean phase anyway. one, yeah. is they will not lend on that property until it is clean. And so you don't want to be in a situation where, because the seller didn't tell you they don't have a clean phase one, and you put up this non of earnest money, that you're just out that money. This is, oh, okay, this is what we call a stupid tax. It's like not using an attorney playing the lottery, yeah. like there's all of these stupid taxes, not getting environmental studies on your properties, a phase one that's less than $2,000. Most of the time it's like 1500 bucks, 1900 bucks. That is a stupid tax, tax not doing it. One of these days it's going to bite you. Yeah, so you want to make sure that you have, if you do non-refundable earnest money, which is, is a great idea to get an asset, um, is you give yourself an out for environmental issues. Second is uh, material adverse change clause. And so what does that mean? A lot of sellers are going to balk at this. Yeah. But how you pitch it is really important. And how we've pitched it in the past is, look, Mr. Seller, you have said in this OM that this property produces, you know, let's say $400,000 in net operating income. Or, I mean, more simple, that you have these tenants that are open, operating, and current with their rent balances at this center. Yeah. So rent roll and NOI. Yeah. Let's, let's just take those two things. And so... If you present a rent roll that shows 95% occupied and you show NOI of $400,000, but then, and we go non-refundable based on the information that you gave us, but that information turns out to be false or misleading. Let's say that your occupancy, you didn't tell us that two tenants moved out. They're on the rent roll, but they're not there anymore or they're not paying. That's a material adverse change. You know, the, the deals of the, the, the terms of the deal have material, materially changed from what you, you know, showed us in the OM. Uh, we want to retrade, and if that changes during after you've signed uh, an LOI, does that does that well, matter? Uh, after you, you sign a purchase and sale agreement, yeah. Then yes, if you have that clause in there, then that will allow you to to walk away or renegotiate the purchase price without losing that non refundable earnest money. Okay. So you need to have that out in there. And what you tell them is, look, as long as the deal that you presented is the deal that I'm closing on, then yes, my my money is non refundable and I will close. Yeah. The idea is that at some point from the time that you go under contract to the time that you close, if tenants move out, if tenants file bankruptcy, or if you find out some adverse change in the, the net operating income that you get to change, and all you're saying is, seller, look, we want you to take the risk up until the closing date. After the closing date, we'll take the risk. Mm -hmm. If tenants move out after the closing date, that's on us. If the income goes down uh, after the closing date, that's on us. We just want the seller to take the risk up until the time that we purchase the property. And I don't think it's too much to ask. And if you can talk through that with the seller, typically you can get them to agree to that. 
Okay. Now there's one other. That's why you get Joel on the phone with the uh, seller right there. Yeah. And so there's one other, uh, there's a third thing, I think, um, environmental material, adverse change, clean Clean title. title. And so clean title is a pretty easy one. All you're saying there is, Hey, we want insurable, marketable, lendable title. And, and so we're not going to be able to do that ahead of going under contract. And that's just not something that we're going to spend a lot of money chasing down before we have a signed purchase and sale agreement. So all we're saying is we're going on a fundable on, on our earnest money, but we just want to ensure that the title we're getting is clean and, and marketable. And that's most sellers agree to that as well. Okay. All right. We have other points, but one more point on non-refundable earnest money. It's, it's a bear. I mean, you can see there's all of these steps you have to do in order to offer non-refundable earnest money because you're really having to pre-inspect before you get in contract, right? This is what we're trying to do, or at least build in these outs where if you fail those certain things, even after they're inspected that you can get out. But another one is you got to get boots on the ground, right? You got to go for a site visit. You got to go for a property tour. It's not only going to make you look like a very attractive prospective buyer that you're willing to invest your time, your energy, your funds to bring you and your team out there to walk the property, audit some leases, audit some units, make sure it exists, check the condition. That that gives you confidence um, in the sense of, you know, I went out there and I didn't see the roof caving in or leaking. It was wet and there wasn't ponds everywhere. The asphalt parking lot was in good condition and maybe has a few more years left. Yeah, basically, uh, a site visit does two things. First, if you're going to go with non-refundable earnest money, you reduce your risk by getting eyes on the asset ahead of time Yeah, uh, because you will then see potential issues that you might run into. And you may say, okay, this is not one that I want to do non-refundable earnest money on. The other thing, though, as a seller, I can say is if I get a bunch of offers and two out of the five offers didn't even bother going to the property, haven't seen the property, and haven't even been in the city that the property is being sold in, then that offer is going to be less attractive. And so today's podcast is about, hey, how do I get my offer to to rise to the top uh, versus the competitors? Is one is do a thorough walkthrough of the property if you are interested in that asset. It tells the seller that you're serious and that you've you've been to the property and nothing scared you off, that you're still willing to, to make a good offer after being, you know, having gone to the site. So that's important. Yeah, most of the time, if somebody's not willing to do a property tour, they're wasting your time. I, w- I would say that. I would say that. Yeah. And they may say, well, I'll, I'll go to the property once we get it under contract. You know, yeah, maybe, you know, and, and would I care as much if they were offering non-refundable earnest money? No. If they were offering non-refundable earnest money, then the site visit means a little bit less. Most likely they won't offer that if they haven't done a site visit. But if they don't, if they don't have any non-refundable earnest money and they haven't, they're saying, I'm not going to go to the site until I get under contract. Well, then... You know, you don't know what you're getting. You may spend a few thousand dollars negotiating a purchase and sale agreement, and then they show up to the site and like, yeah, we don't like it, and then they're out. And, but you you wasted that time and money negotiating a purchase and sale with someone that you didn't even know was serious. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, if you want your offer to stand out, first, non refundable earnest money with caveats. Second, is go to the site ahead of time and have that be part of your resume. Hey, we've been to the site, we've toured it, we're good with it. All right, moving on and kind of back to your timeline question on due diligence once we've got all this stuff kind of figured out. Is a normal, reasonable, very freaking reasonable amount of time is a month, guys. It's, yep. uh, it's normal. Mm-hmm. I, I guarantee it. There's people who offer 45 all the time. There's people who offer 60 all the time. If I could get away with it, I'd do it too. I get it. Yep. Feel, felt, found. You know, I understand. You can get it done in a month. Just do it. If you yeah, so, time to do so it, hire somebody else to do it. Average due diligence time in our industry, okay, is a 30-day, we call it a 30-day look and a 30-day close. Yeah. 30 days of inspection. Once that inspection's done, earnest money of some kind should go non-refundable. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then you have 30 days to close. Which is really just getting your financing in order, finalizing the appraisal. I mean, and, and, uh, getting it to, wrapped up. To think it through is okay, we're under contract, uh, but I don't, you know, I haven't done my due diligence yet and I don't want to spend, you know, three or 4,000 on an appraisal uh, before I know if my inspections are going well and if there's anything that's going to deter me from buying it. Right, that's why I said that. You're doing the appraisal after you've made the decision to do it just because you have the luxury of that typically. Now, that being said, last year, 2022, when the market was on fire, 
uh, appraisers were backed up. I mean, we were seeing like 36 day lead times on an appraisal. So in that circumstance, I mean, maybe call and quote it out. We're typically getting three, I mean, two or three realistically quotes on an appraisal. So ask their lead time. If it's two, if it's within a month, definitely wait. And then the other point is we use up our kind of free oh shit time at the end. What I love to put in offers is, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Seller, if we were to give you another non-refundable earnest money deposit, would you give us another two weeks at the very end? And nine times out of 10, they're going to do this. They've gotten my first earnest money deposit that's non-refundable. They got the second one after the inspection period, which is now non-refundable. At this point, everything is lined up. We've inspected it. We've gone through title. They've seen all of my inspections. They're very amicable to give you two weeks because right now, they they have you on the hook and they're just reeling you in the boat, you know? So if you actually have, I mean, don't just exercise it to waste somebody's time, but you always have a lender issue or some crap. I mean, there's there's always something, right? There's always something. Okay, a couple more points to get your offer to the top is shorten the due diligence. So, uh, you know, it could be that you don't need 30 days to uh, inspect the property. Maybe you can have a property condition report or somebody go out there that can inspect the property and you can do it in 15 days, mm -hmm. 21 days, two, three weeks. We've done that a lot and it, it helps. You know, cause we, you know, let's say you set your offer has 20 days of due diligence and you're gonna bust it. As soon as that contract signs, you're hiring people, you're going to the site and you're done within 20 days, earnest money, non-refundable after that. And another person puts in 45 days, which is also, you know, fairly common. As a seller, I'm, I'm going to want to get a buyer on the deal or off the deal as soon as possible. So 21 days is better. After that 21 days, I know, do I have non-refundable earnest money? Am I moving to closing or, or are they out? But I don't want to wait 45 days. Uh, you know, so 21 days, 14 days is better than, than, 20, than, you know, 30 days or 45 days. So that's yeah. another area to, to separate yourself. I would say these are like sub, sub 15, 20 million dollar deals. You know, when you, when you can get up there in property size, you can probably see some longer inspection periods. I would imagine, you know, like some massive apartment complexes. I'm, I'm yeah. sure can have some. And then, um, what's, what's next? Uh, financing, right? Well, yeah. Um, so I, that's what I was going to bring up. So I'm thinking the last time I sold a house and I had offers on my house yeah. and people had contingencies, right? One was contingent on selling their house. One was contingent on then getting the loan. Trash. I assume any contingencies uh, in the contract are probably looked at negatively by the seller. For sure. They're garbage. They're, ab they're absolute free. A contingency is a contingency. The only reason they're taking our environmental contingency is because they don't think they have an environmental problem. The only reason they're taking our clear title contingency is because they don't think they're going to deliver bad title. Yeah, Same thing with material adverse change. This one... This was the worst. If as a seller, if someone came to me and said, "I want a financing contingency," that's the worst to me, because depending on how it's worded, they could Pull they could tell anything. their lender, "Hey, deny me for this yeah. loan," right. you know, and then they're like, "We didn't get qualified," and we're two months into the process, and they're bailing. Right. And so, if you're going to agree to a financing contingency, I would have that expire with whatever due diligence period you have. Like at some point, you've got to say, "I'm in or I'm out." And to leave a financing contingency hanging out there, uh, there's just too many ways to wiggle out of that one. Where environmental is really clear. Are there environmental issues or are there not? But on financing, we have lenders on any given deal. Some lenders will say, no, we're not going to lend. And some lenders will say yes. But all the seller would have to do on a financing contingency is just say, hey, we were unable to get acceptable financing. It's, it's just yeah. not going to happen. And, and so they could, for sure, they'll find, find a lender that are gonna, that's going to tell them they don't want to lend on it. Or they'll try to get terms that are not market and that no lender is going to give them. And they'll say, hey, no one will give us 99% loan to value. So we're out. So, so let's try to think of an example where we would take a financing contingency. If somebody gave you non-refundable earnest money and they were willing to let you keep it, even if they took their financing contingency, would you take that deal? Uh, so... Is, is your earnest money non-refundable or not? It's 100% non, non-refundable, but they can walk away. If they don't get their funding. If they don't get their but funding. But I, the, I get the earnest money and you they get, walk away? Yeah. Yeah, I would do that. Yeah. I mean, if, I, if I'm getting money uh, for them telling me they're not going to buy the property, I can still sell it to somebody else. Uh, but if you're trying to get, you, remember the whole premise of the show is you found a really good deal and you want to put yourself in a position to buy that deal, I would waive financial contingency. And in that due diligence period, whatever that 
period is, yeah, uh, 15 days, 21 days, 30 days, I would make sure that I had a lender that I was confident could do the deal. How do we, so, how do we make sure a lender is confident in doing the deal? That's a great question. Um, I would try to have them submit it to final loan committee prior to uh, the, the, the due diligence period expiring. I would try to do that. So guys, uh, we, we probably know, I mean, getting a lender through final loan committee is probably like a month from the time. Maybe could, they could just, be, could be three weeks. Yeah. So we're doing that at the beginning of this, right? Because at the end of the inspection period, we need to have that signed commitment letter. We need to have that through final loan committee. We need to have them on the hook, right? Saying <laughs> we will end. And a lot of times what will happen with a lender, uh, is that they will give you loan commitment, but, it will be based on the appraisal coming in sure. on, on target or on there being no material adverse change. Well, great. So you, you'll say, well, I, you know, I have this non phone number earnest money. What if I don't get, what if I don't, the appraisal didn't come in? Well, just, just add that to your contingency language on your non refundable earnest money. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to give you a hundred thousand non-refundable, but it's contingent on no environmental mm -hmm. issues. It's contingent on, uh, you know, What's the material adverse change, clean title, and the appraiser from a certified appraiser in the state of the property is located in coming in at the, the purchase price? I'd take that deal. Yeah. So, you know, as a seller, you're going to be confident that what you're selling at, someone's going to appraise it at. And so if you're saying it's $5 million and the appraisal comes in at 4.8, either you can get out with your earnest money or the seller can reduce the price or you can agree to pay the five with a lower appraisal. But at least you have it in there as an out. But, but definitely, uh, take out the financial contingency, consider non refundable earnest money, shorten your due diligence period, and go to the job site. The last thing you can consider is your reputation on being a closer. So are there brokers that you have closed with? Uh, you know, Have you closed with this broker before? Having a reputation as being someone that gets deals closed and maybe showing that track record is another thing to give the seller when you're trying to get a deal. Uh, you know, if I if I have several offers and one of them, you know, buys uh, Section Eight voucher apartments, and that let's say that's what I'm selling is is 1970s apartments in Tulsa, and one person that's all they buy is you know older Section Eight income type apartments, and another person they're mom and pop and it's their first time to get an apartment over 10 units. Yeah. Well, which one am I going to go with? I'm going to go with the one that's proven that I think has a, a, is a better chance to close it because what they do. Yeah, we've had uh, multiple times, we've been not the highest bidder, right? But we've been close and the broker knows us and goes to the seller and says, hey, they're a little bit less, but- These guys but are the, these the closers. These guys are for real. And, yeah. And I won. love that because it shows we're disciplined in our offering and it shows that you gotta do what you say you're gonna do because the world's a small place. You know, there's yeah. a lot of times where we've used brokers at Marcus and Millichap or, or Stan Johnson or Northmark or, or all of these other places. And they can put in a good word. It's like, Hey, these are real people. Once they get in contract, they're going to close you. They're not going to screw you over. I mean, if you hear that from a person you trust, that's, that's a shoe in versus some random person in Utah who is their f first time or something. It's like, you have no idea. You just, you have no idea. So you're again, just trying to vet these things and, and again, you can put that in your application. We, we obviously have a decent web presence uh, because, well, obviously. Um, so put your website in there. Um, we're everywhere there. like such as. Put, put your track record, <laughs> put references, put uh, properties you own in your LOI or easily uh, retrievable for them to get. So when they're looking at your offer, again, they can give you those bonus points. Wow, this group owns similar properties they're uh located close to here they own stuff close to here i mean it, it makes sense and it helps make your offer more competitive all right so we're going to wrap this up guys yeah. but i think the important thing is this you're going to have two types of opportunities when you're buying commercial real estate one is is the 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 deal that nobody wants that that you found that's a diamond in the rough and you don't have competition on that that's when you negotiate to win yeah. okay but then there's going to be other deals that are deals of the decade and they're right in front of everybody and there's going to be competition on those because people are seeing the same dollar signs that you're seeing. And so you have to play to win when you're going after those types of deals, because some of those deals could be generational money for you uh, and your family. If you can just get control of that deal, cause you know, it's going to double in value or there's some massive upside. 
And so the things that we've talked about today can put you in a position to get that great deal that you may not have otherwise had. Uh, if you'll, you'll take note of some of these strategies in order to move your offer up to the top of the list. All right, guys. Well, if you are still listening on the podcast platform, make sure to drop us a review, iTunes, Spotify, wherever hit the five star button. We would sure appreciate it. Anyway, we will catch you guys next week. Yeah. Appreciate it guys. Thank you. See you.